Hello, students of Africa. I hope you're doing well. Today, I want to talk with you about what we call the economic thrust of colonization. You have your notes on the religious slash educational and the political governmental thrust, and this will complete your understanding of how colonization worked in these three main ways. Some of this material will intersect with the film, This Magnificent African Cake, which um, if you haven't watched already, you should soon. And some of it will be new, but what I hope it will give you by the end is a sort of framework for understanding the economic thrust in general. The ways in which the European colonizers um, moved on the economic front varied quite a lot over the continent, but looking back on it, we can see that there were seven common practices or policies that were used by the various European countries. Not by all of them and all the colonies, but um, generally these were the ones that uh, were used the most. So the first is what we call the expropriation of land. And that's just a fancy way of saying that they seized these territories. They grabbed them, they made them national assets of the European countries, and they claimed ownership over the land and the resources that was, uh, the resources that were within the land. Second was the exploitation of labor. So in order to extract these resources, whether that meant through farming or digging mines for um, various uh, raw materials, you needed to have a labor force to do it. And the labor conditions varied, but in general, they were poor. Um, when it was paid labor, the wages were low. And um, in some cases, the labor was forced and unpaid, and um, in many cases, the conditions were uh, really horrible. So, for example, um, to grow cotton or cocoa on a big plantation, um, laborers were recruited. Uh, in some cases, they were paid if they um, resisted or did things that were considered to be um, wrong. They could be whipped um, with whips that were typically made from the hide of a rhinoceros. And um, the conditions were not that different in, from slave labor on the plantations in the New World. Third was the imposition of cash crops. So generally before um, colonization, we had what was called subsistence agriculture, where families planted what they needed, a variety of crops, in order to feed themselves, to subsist. And after colonization, we see whole colonies being dedicated to producing a single crop like coffee or cocoa or groundnuts. In some cases, it was two crops. But um, in any case, you have uh, a real lack of ecological diversity as a result. And some of you may know that when you have what's called a monocrop, uh, agriculture, that crop is really susceptible to disease and the disease quickly spreads throughout the whole crop. So this led to, in some cases, really bad harvest some years and in some cases, even famine. 
it was not unusual for families to be able to keep a small kind of kitchen garden with um, more vegetables, um, fruits than the colony was dedicated to producing. Uh, but this was um, really a, a real shrinking of the diversity of the um, uh, agriculture in the colony in any case. Uh, fourth was unfair taxation. So there were two types of tax that were imposed, a hut tax and the poll tax, P-O-L-L. -L. And the rationale for these taxes was that the colonial government needed to have funds in order to support its activities. The various district officers and their staffs that were there uh, needed to have some source of revenue to support them. So while it may seem hard to believe, the Africans were actually taxed to raise money for the colonial overlords. Yeah. And the hut tax was a flat amount that was imposed on however many huts were in the compound, so roughly equivalent to the size of the family that was there. And the poll tax, this is also called a head tax, was imposed on all men 16 years or older. Now, in addition to the stated goal of raising money to support the colonial administration, there was also this goal, and that was to coerce cooperation in the European labor system, which, by which I mean the system of labor that was imposed by the Europeans. So these taxes could only be paid in European currency, and the only way to earn that currency would be by willingly joining a labor crew, whether it be on a farm or a mine or some other business. So while some Africans did not want to contribute to these labor forces, the poll tax in particular was a way to encourage them to or urge them to or coerce them to participate in these labor systems. The fifth common practice that developed um, a couple decades into colonization was the importation of labor from outside of Africa. So uh, many African men refused to participate in the um, systems of labor that were set up by the colonial administrations and they did not have enough labor as a result even though in some cases if you resisted uh, paying the tax for example because you didn't have the money because you hadn't earned the European currency you would be dragged away to a labor camp and forced to work there to kind of make up for what you hadn't paid there still was a shortage of labor for the various projects, in some cases, infrastructure projects like building roads. So the Europeans started inviting people from other places, and in particular, India, to come and work in Africa for wages. And this was done on a mass scale so that it really changed the complexion of Africa. And you have um, a legacy where a lot of Indians um, have lived now for generations with their families in Africa, to the point where we can find by the middle of the 20th century someone like uh, Mahatma Gandhi living in South Africa. And we're not surprised by that. Um, Six was what we call the de facto prohibition of inter-African trade and communication. 
I'll break that down for you a little bit. De facto means they weren't legally prohibited from trading between colonies, but the fact of the matter was that they really couldn't. The means were not there for them to do that. Um, and by trade and communication, I'll take it one at a time, trade, this was affected uh, largely because if you look at the map of Africa and you look at a map where it shows which European countries colonized um, which areas, you see a kind of patchwork so that you would have a colony of Britain next to a colony of France next to a colony of Germany next to a colony of Portugal. And over time, over decades, um, the kind of common language by which people in this colony communicated was the European language. So you have generations in Ghana, for example, growing up, learning how to speak English, whereas right next door in Cote d'Ivoire or the Ivory Coast, you have people growing up learning how to speak French. And the communication systems were such that if you were someone and you know by decades into colonization you actually have professional people you have doctors and lawyers even who are african and if you want to make a call to a counterpart in a neighboring colony you had to, let's say you were in the capital of Nigeria, which is a British colony, Lagos, place a call to the operator in London, and the operator in London would connect with the operator in Paris, and the operator in Paris would connect to the Ivory Coast, where your counterpart was. Well, this was complicated, uh, sometimes it didn't work well, and it was always expensive to place such calls. So there was a kind of de facto um, ban on inter-African communication. The same goes for trade. The infrastructure, the roads, for example, that I mentioned before, was all built from the interior of one colony to the coast. It was built for the extraction of raw materials, which were then uh, shipped from that port up to Europe, where they were turned into manufactured goods for export. That's the way all the systems of infrastructure were set up to take from the interior of a given colony and funnel it down to the ports for shipment out, not for exchange with other African colonies. And so while this worked well enough during the time of colonization, you can start to imagine not just for this practice, but for the other ones that I've covered so far, how after colonization ends, you're going to be in a situation where you're really dependent on Europe. You're not independent. You don't have an independent economy that is set up to flourish in a new kind of post-colonization African, trans-African economy. And this is going to take decades to try to undo. Lastly, and a kind of related point, is not something that was done per se, like these other points, but something that was not done that had a long-term impact. And that is that there was a lack of industrialization in Africa. So remember that all of this colonization is happening in the late 19th and early to mid 20th century when Europe, America, and other places are involved in massive industrialization of their countries. So their landscapes and their economies are changing rapidly. Meanwhile, Africa under European rule is left behind. Uh, 
all of this progress that had been made. And when in the 1950s and 60s, when independence starts to be achieved by these African former colonies and countries, um, they look around and see that they don't have factories. They don't have the plants to even process the raw materials that their colonies had been set up to produce. So in order to start making profits from these goods after they achieve independence, they have to send them off to Europe for a long time to be processed at prices that the Europeans set rather than process them at home and gain the profits to be made by doing that. So that's the seven. And um, in addition to having those in your notes, um, I hope that you will take some time to kind of look over them and think about them as a whole and write a really good um, summary statement at the bottom for uh, what you consider to be the overall impact of the economic thrust of colonization on Africa. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.